Security correspondent uh, David Ensor, talking about the different role now that intelligence and security might play in the life of the United States, a departure from the traditions here. And there was another example today of how the face of life in the United States might be changing when the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, at a briefing, talked about talked about aircraft, uh, about uh, jet aircraft, uh, the combat aircraft we've seen over Washington, D.C. and New York the last couple of days as the country has tried to protect itself, military aircraft flying over the United States. Now, Wolfowitz, to put it very mildly, is an understated man, but he talked about something quite remarkable in the briefing. There are uh, costs already incurred with the uh, uh, air, combat air patrols that have been maintained over a significant number of American cities, including Washington. Uh, the costs mount rapidly, and they will mount more rapidly as this campaign develops. This has not been something that uh, the United States has seen, at least not in what had been called peacetime. But of course, many are people saying, many people are saying what we had here was a declaration of war in the United States. Now, you might be able to see over my shoulder the large American flag that has been unfurled over the Pentagon that was put there by people just trying to express the continuing spirit of the U.S. Uh, in the face of the, the collision with the aircraft right next to it. Now, one of the people whose office was on the fourth floor under the flag managed to survive. It's Dick Goodman, who is a Navy lieutenant, who talked to me a while ago. When we were out in the courtyard, uh, there were some people that were, uh, that were injured and having trouble breathing. Um, helped them out as best we could. The people from the health clinic and the Pentagon hadn't come out yet with, with uh, equipment yet, so um, made do with what you could. Um, tried to calm some people down, clear airways. Um, and then I ended up going back in with a group of other people um, that had some medical training and with some of the uh, security folks headed back into the building uh, to see if we could if there were other people who needed assistance and you can see the flag that uh, is on the pentagon under that flag on the fourth floor was uh, lieutenant greg goodman's office uh, describing what happened after he was able to get away and go out in the courthouse he's an ems technician now uh, he was lucky he was one of the survivors we're now being told by uh, various people within the pentagon that uh, they are now expecting that the final casualty count will be uh, not casualty count but the number of people who are killed by what occurred here will be approximately 190 and that would include the 64 who are on that American Airlines plane that crashed two days ago into the Pentagon. You can still see the evidence of it there. Body recovery is still going on. And Aaron, we're told that the remains will be taken to Dover, Delaware. That has been the place where the other victims of other wars that the United States has fought, other military actions, have been brought as they've been returned to the U.S. Of course, in this particular case, these are remains who, of people who died in what many people say is a military action in the United States. Aaron? The number, again, just for clarification, includes the people on the plane that hit the Pentagon and the people in the Pentagon itself who were lost, correct? That's right. It is 194. It includes the 64 who were on the plane as well as those who they believe that they're going to find inside. And we, we would we go back about 24 hours, and I think it might have been in the briefing, Bob, when uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said that the reports that were coming out at the time, which had... Uh, uh, a death toll much, much higher. I, I, I believe the number that was being tossed around was about 800, was considerably too high. One never looks at a number like this, the 194 people, and says it is good news, but it is certainly better news than what it might have been. Well, the uh, people at the Pentagon, to be honest with you, were very irritated that that figure was been, had been bandied about. We made a real point uh, yesterday throughout the reporting to say that that was one estimate, an estimate from a fire chief here who admitted that he was only guessing. The Pentagon people repeatedly said they did not believe it was going to be that high. Then they told us that uh, there were about 150 uh, military people who were unaccounted for who were inside the building. And now their estimate, and I underline estimate, is that there will be about 190. Uh, Bob, thanks. Bob Franken at the Pentagon. This new normal that we are crawling towards, and that's really what's happening across the country, true baby steps, can be seen at Los Angeles International Airport where uh, international flight or flights have now arrived. These are people, there were some 30,000 people stranded in Canada, some now getting home. Chris Burns is there and can tell us more about the scene at LAX. Chris? Yes, I can. There's uh, quite a few people getting off buses here. They just got off an Alitalia flight that arrived uh, from Calgary, where they were there for a couple of days. The flight was diverted 
from a flight between Milan and Los Angeles, and the flight has now come to Los Angeles. With me is one of the passengers who was on the plane. His name is Vikan Sulahin. Vikan, how, uh, how do you feel right now getting off that plane? I feel very relieved. I'm very happy to be home, at least. And, uh, but pretty anxious, weren't you? Very anxious, and we've been in the hotel waiting for the phone call that we've been calling, calling the airline, when is the, net, when is the flight going to take off? And they would just keep on telling us that we have to wait in the hotel room until we, we call you. Right. So it was like... A, and how was, uh, how was the security like today? It was very tough. We were in the airport for since after midnight, and the, the plane took off uh, about 9 a.m. in Calgary time, local time. How did they search you? Uh, thoroughly. It was very intense, very, very intense. We had to wait in lines and lines, and everybody was being searched very intensively. How, did, how were they searching you, actually? What were they looking for? Uh, through the handbags, and they were like every small things they were questioning, and they were looking for some weapons, I guess. Squeezing out toothpaste tubes, things like everything, that? Everything, everything, even cameras, even everything yeah. with ba battery operated feed. How long did that take? How many hours? That process took about like three hours, and then we had to wait in the plane until we get the clearance, the airway. And how did you feel about getting on this flight two days after those, those two, those three, those four planes were crashed? I know, a terrible news, but uh, I feel very happy to be home for now. Relieved? Very much, very much. You're among about 170 people who were on that plane. What was the mood on that plane? And among these people who are getting off right now? Everybody were, were anxious just to get to their final destination. And um, everybody was happy. And the scene in the terminal was just phenomenal. It was just like in, as if in the movies. Was I've it? never seen LAX like this so much, so many cops. And it was just like a ghost town. Really? Yes. How emotional was this? Uh, were were the people on that plane? Very emotional. Everybody was anxious just to get to their home and feel safe. Why don't we back up on Tuesday when your flight was diverted? Yes. What was said on the plane? What did the captain say? They just said that they uh, they cannot land in the in the U.S. and they had to land somewhere in Canada because all the airways were blocked and we didn't know what was the reason until we landed in the airport and everybody tried to make phone calls. And and when you landed and you found that out, how did you feel? We couldn't believe it until we went to the actually hotel and opened up the TV and actually saw what happened. And it just, until now, it just doesn't sink in. Did a thought pass through your mind that you could have been on one of those planes yes. on that day? You were on a plane on that day. Yes, I was. And actually, my brother is in New York right now. He was going to come from New York to L.A. And I talked to him. He's OK. He's fine. So. And you think you'll fly again soon? For now, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. But maybe the security today gave you some confidence? What do you think? Yes, if they do security like this, it'll build up the confidence in the people that they can fly again. But otherwise, it's really hard to say. Vicky, do you live here in Los Angeles? Yes, I do. So it's good to be home, huh? Yes. Thank you. Feeling. Thanks, Vicky. Yes. Thank thanks you. very much. All right, we've got a few more people here getting off, getting off and on buses here, a bit of a scene of confusion as people uh, uh, try to find their families and their loved ones. Um, excuse me, are you from, uh, are you from the Alitalia flight? Yes. You are from the Alitalia? Yes. And how does, how does it feel to be on the ground now? I don't know, something problem, because I don't know, those, those guys saying right now, same dated, I don't know, maybe it's just different thing, maybe stop today here and gotta go tomorrow, maybe, I don't know. Now, so you're, so you're waiting for a flight then? You didn't yes, get off the Alitalia? Yes, waiting for a flight. Yeah. There's a mix here of people getting off the Alitalia flight and looking for, to wait to get on flights as well. What, uh, how, what are your feelings about flying today? Well, I, I, I think so. Everybody has the same problem like that. By how me. worried are you? Oh, uh, it's terrible. It's terrible, this problem like that, because I don't know why. Are you fearful about flying? Yes. And I, 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 I lose almost three days right now here in Los Angeles. I suppose stay last three days before over there in, Los, in, in Italy. Where are you from? Italy. From Italy? Yes. Right. So you came off this Alitalia flight. That's right. And now you're waiting for another flight. There's another flight. How maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe coming, maybe no, because maybe cancel today, okay. maybe coming tomorrow, or maybe, I don't know. What, did you, th th last, what did you think about the security today? The security is terribly. It's hard. Really hard. hard. It's a question. Every, every, every person, every person 
open air and check at everything inside. Well, yes. What kind of things were they looking at? What were they looking, looking for? Looking for something, a uh, pistol or a knife or something like that, you know. Because, right, Did right? that make you feel better that that security was so tight? I think so. I think so. Feel bad, bad because it's not, it's not necessarily too much problem like this. It's uh, before make it this, this, this problem, not right now, because it's right now it's terrible. Yes. And, and let me ask you, when, when you found out what happened on Tuesday, you got off that plane, it was diverted to Calgary. How did you feel when you found out about the terrorist attacks? Well, this is really terrible because this is the first time in the, in the, in the history, this, this big, big problem, exactly in the center of the, the, the New York. I don't know why those guys, I believe those guys mentioned one year before it started this problem like this. But uh, right now, this really, really close, those guys, because it's exactly what they're doing. And Pentagon, and two, and two Tor, and this really center, this center New York. I'm, I'm really, I'm surprised, really surprised. Because yeah, it's right. First, really, really, first time Thanks. in the, in the, in the, in the in Thanks. This, this, this one. First time. Thanks very really. much. Thanks very much. Back to Darren in uh, the studio. Back to Aaron in, in uh, New York. Chris, thank you. I wouldn't call it a studio, but you got the city right. Thank you for your work out there today. Uh, quickly back to John Boz. John has been uh, following now the threat of a collapse of the American Express building about a block or so from uh, the Trade Center. John, are you able to hear me? Aaron, yes, I hear you. We had a few moments ago, we had uh, three blasts from the siren. That was their first evacuation order of the day. It appears that work has continued as normal. There was some threat that the Millennium Hotel may be coming down. There was a partial collapse here at the same time, all around the same time of Building 1. That uh, threat appears to have passed as far as the hotel is concerned, but we are told that the building is listing to a degree and has uh, workers here very, very concerned. Right now, I'm, I'm at the site of uh, Tower Number 1. It's an incredible site. The, the, the debris is, you know, 100, 100 feet tall. There are lines of men just moving debris by hand from buckets, passing it from one to the other. Um, there is hundreds, thousands of people working here right now. John, stay where you are. I wonder if just for a second uh, we can put up the map that we have just to show uh, where the buildings are, the relationships uh, uh, of these buildings that are listing uh, or in danger of collapse. Uh, as you take a look at the, what was the World Trade Center complex on Tuesday morning and is now a disaster zone at the highest level now. So the sure. American Express building is listing a bit, uh, and that's what has people concerned. John, is, the, uh, is it still relatively calm there? Are people moving calmly away? It is extraordinarily calm given the circumstances. Um, there was a brief moment when people ran, but still, even when, when they run away from this scene, it is in a calm, orderly fashion. People are told to get out, and they move. They move very, very quickly. We were told to move, and we ran with them. Um, as far as the placements of buildings, if you recall, there was a lot of uh, conjecture about the safety of uh, Liberty Plaza, which were, is now being turned into a morgue. That is safe, but that is opposite the World Trade Center on Church Street. Um, the in hotel is about a block up uh, directly opposite the World Trade Center and that took uh, the brunt of the blast when the building collapsed. So if I followed that, I think I did, we're talking about uh, really a sort of a one block area around the complex where these buildings are threatened. They're in a number of different directions, but basically it's a one block area uh, from Liberty Plaza, one Liberty Plaza, the American Express building on uh, the west side, towards the west side highway, uh, if I get the orientation correct, okay. Aaron, and the Millennium uh, Hotel. To, excuse me, I must go now, Aaron. I will call you okay. straight back. Thank you. Absolutely. Get out, get out of harm's way. We don't want you hanging around and putting yourself at risk. We're going to keep uh, a camera on that building, obviously, for as long as we can. Uh, officials did go into One Liberty Plaza, which at about this time yesterday was uh, thought to be in some danger of collapsing and we were out there we we could see pieces of window falling off on at least the two sides of the building we were able to see um, and uh, some inspectors went into the building today and at least for now they say that building 
is okay. That building, among other things, houses the executive offices, the corporate offices of the NASDAQ. Uh, so much of what is in Lower Manhattan, uh, as, as you all know now, uh, involves Wall Street, involves uh, financial